Uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Whittington Lecture. So I'm Mike Bailey, I'm the Interim Dean of the McCourt School of Public Policy and this event honors uh, Leslie Whittington. So Leslie was a professor of public policy at the Georgetown Public Policy Institute um, and she, uh, she and her uh, husband Chuck and her two daughters, Dana and Zoe, uh, passed away in the September 11th terrorist attacks. So uh, this is a very special event for us uh, to honor Leslie uh, and to get together and, and do the kind of things that uh, she loved to do. So Leslie was a, um, an economist uh, who studied uh, economics, economics of the family and the effect of tax policy on various uh, aspects of, of families and so forth. Um, and she also was a great teacher. Um, and so there's actually one of the awards for a national public policy uh, school association uh, is named in her honor, and it's a, a very fitting tribute to her. Um, and so, like I said, uh, this is a really uh, uh, important uh, moment to us, and so we're really thrilled to have uh, such a great speaker and to be able to uh, welcome Dr. Kristalina Gorgieva, who is the, uh, uh, the CEO of the World Bank. So Dr. Gorgieva is going to be discussing um, one of the most pressing uh, issues in, uh, uh, in the world, but it's also an issue, as you'll see, that really connects so many aspects of economic, social, and political life, and that is the future of work. Um, and so we're very much uh, looking forward uh, uh, to that. So, but before we do a, a, a more uh, detailed introduction, I also want to just kind of situate this a little bit and note that um, us having Dr. Gorgieva, who's uh, you know, uh, leading the World Bank, is really a, a neat thing for us to be able to situate McCourt and Georgetown in this, uh, um, to emphasize how much we care about and value the broader global community and the broader global perspective. And so, um, you know, about half of our students in the uh, Masters of Public Policy, the Masters of International Development Policy, and the Data Science for Public Policy programs, about half of them are international. Um, and our faculty is, is deeply, deeply interested in and committed to an expert in a lot of global uh, uh, issues. And so um, uh, 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 Professor Kent Weaver, who I'm sure many of you know, is an expert in governance and uh, uh, global retirement policies. And then our, our uh, faculty interested in development is really, really strong, ranging from uh, Professor Kugler, uh, to Asa, to Javier Imana, Tobin, Zeitlin. Uh, it's really, uh, that's just in McCourt. Uh, it's a really uh, impressive group. In addition, we have Sheila Foster, uh, who's doing a global cities project. And so all this is uh, a part of this commitment we have to having a global perspective. And our perspective is, for our students, when they come out, they could be a city manager in Peoria, or they could be you know, leading uh, a you know, leadership position in the World Bank. But either way, like that global perspective and the imprint that we have uh, at McCourt and more broadly at Georgetown is something we really, really value. And, and uh, this uh, uh, talk today is, is indicative of that. Um, I also want to thank uh, uh, Dean Joel Hellman, the, the Dean of the School of Foreign Service. Uh, he's very helpful in, in arranging this event. And uh, we have uh, 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 excellent collaborations where the, the School of Foreign Service and the McCourt School continue to deepen the collaboration collaborations uh, on these kind of issues. So um, uh, uh, that sets the, uh, the stage a little bit. We do one other thing at our, our annual Whittington um, uh, uh, talk, um, and it's an opportunity for us to honor a student in Leslie's name. And so this is, uh, uh, we uh, uh, announce or award our uh, annual scholarship. Um, and this scholarship goes to a second year student at the McCourt School, school who has demonstrated accent, uh, academic excellence uh, and a commitment to public service. And so this year's winner is Alec Brillman. Uh, he's an outstanding student and an excellent leader uh, uh, here at McCourt. Um, and he is uh, 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 interested in environmental policy and in, in, in development. Uh, he's been the president, uh, he is the president of our Energy and Environmental Club, and they're doing things like uh, composting on campus, uh, working on plastics, reducing the number of plastics, and basically you know, trying to you know, live locally and get, do the kind of things that, that are important uh, to reduce Georgetown's carbon uh, footprint. Um, Alex has been a member of our, of our uh, policy conference, um, and outside of Georgetown uh, has been working uh, uh, on, on the, the understanding the potential of mobile money, um, off-grid uh, green energy solutions, and, and other things that can help low-income people in developing countries. So um, what we're going to do is um, we're going to um, uh, uh, celebrate Alex in a second here. And then let's do it now, actually.
Um, and so Alex is going to come up, and he's going to uh, introduce Dr. Gorgieva, and then uh, Dr. Gorgieva will give uh, uh, some uh, a talk. And then after that talk, um, she and I will sit and uh, uh, start our own conversation. But that conversation, really, what we really want is a conversation with all of us. So as you're listening to the various uh, things happening here, please do you know think about the kind of questions you want to um, to ask. So with that, Alex. Uh, thank you, Dean Bailey, for that introduction. Uh, yes, we are very grateful to welcome Dr. Gorgieva to Georgetown as this year's Whittington Lecturer. Uh, as the CEO for the bank's lending arm for poor and middle income countries, uh, Dr. Gorgieva built support across the international community to help mobilize resources and develop more effective solutions to help the poor at scale. Uh, previously, she played a leading role in shaping the agenda of the European Union First as Commissioner for International Cooperation, Humanitarian Aid and Crisis Response, where she managed one of the world's largest humanitarian aid budgets and established herself as a global champion of sustainability. She later served as the Vice President for Budget and Human Resources in charge of the European Union's $175 billion budget and its 33,000 staff members across the globe. She tripled the funding available to help with the refugee crisis in Europe and drove rapid progress towards achieving the Commission's 40% target of women in management by 2019 in order to improve its gender balance. Dr. Gorgieva held multiple positions at the World Bank before joining the European Commission, including Vice President and Corporate Secretary and Director for Sustainable Development. Prior to that, she served in positions such as the World Bank Director for the Russian Federation, Director in Charge of the World Bank Environmental Strategy, Policies, and Lending, and Director for the Environment and Social Development for the East Asia and Pacific region. She began her career at the World Bank as an environmental economist. Clearly, she's deeply knowledgeable about international development and finance. Uh, Dr. Gorgieva established a well-deserved reputation at the bank for her ability to build broad consensus and turn strategies into practice. She has more than 100 publications on environmental and economic policies, including a textbook on microeconomics. She holds a PhD in economic science and an MA in political economy and sociology from the University of National and World Economy from her hometown of Sofia, Bulgaria, where she was an associate professor for 14 years. Dr. Gorgieva is widely respected for her efforts to mobilize the international community to find innovative solutions to today's complex challenges. As the co-chair of the United Nations Secretary General's High-Level Panel on Humanitarian Financing, she secured the adoption of a more effective system to meet the needs of the record number of the world's vulnerable people. She has recently joined with Bill Gates and Ban Ki-moon to spearhead the Global Commission on Adaptation to Address Climate Change, an issue I myself consider to be of paramount importance. Dr. Gorgieva has said, we face a choice business as usual and hope for the best, or we act now and build for a resilient future. Her career has shown her commitment to building this resilient future across sectors and across continents and should serve as an inspiration for us all to do the same. I want to thank Dr. Gorgieva for being with us this evening and please join me in welcoming her to the stage. Thank you. Thank you very much for such a kind uh, introduction. Uh, good evening, everybody. It is fantastic to be here and uh, to be introduced by somebody who cares about environment. My uh, personal uh, journey uh, on environment uh, started uh, in Bulgaria, and it was driven by two uh, reasons. The first one was actually quite serious. Um, a member of my immediate family got sick because of heavy metal uh, pollution of groundwater, completely avoidable. If he were to know and just drink clean water, he would have been healthy. The second reason was a bit, uh, uh, shall I say, stranger than that. 
uh, I had to choose my PhD field. And in these uh, days in Bulgaria, uh, under communism, we were mandated to justify the validity of our thesis by quoting Marx, Lenin, and the Communist Party Congresses. I had actually no problem with Marx. I have no problem with Marx up to that very day. I had a little bit of a problem with Lenin, and I sure had a big problem with the party congresses. So I said to myself, what is the theme that these guys have said nothing about happened to be environment? <laughs> so I did, my, I did my PhD on environmental policy in the United States in the 80s. So uh, that is how I came to, to embrace environment. Well, you would say, why the United States? Guess why? Because I can criticize environmental policy in the United States. <laughs> um, so, uh, but then, of course, uh, I was incredibly uh, fortunate uh, to uh, start working for the bank in 93. And uh, I can tell you that from my heart of heart, I believe we are incredibly fortunate. We have a mission to die for, because what we work uh, on and for are the world's most destitute uh, people. And it is our job to give them hope and jobs and a future. Um, I was uh, uh, incredibly touched to be invited to speak exactly uh, on, on that series of Leslie uh, Whittington, because like many of us, um, actually millions of people, I remember very vividly 9-11, where exactly I was. I was in, in my office at the World Bank how I saw the second uh, plane uh, hitting uh, uh, in New York, the second tower, where I took my staff, and that was the time when her flight hit the Pentagon. And uh, I also took with me, and I, and I hold it deeply in my heart, that conviction that that day also was a huge symbol of fragility of our world that has only gotten worse. Yes, we are a richer planet today than we were uh, then. Um, global GDP is some $80 trillion, but because of conflicts, because of climate change, because of population being pushed out of their homes because of financial stress. We see more shocks. We experience more fragility in the world today, even in the rich uh, countries. And of course, poor countries are particularly severely affected. And uh, what we also see is that technology is accelerating change so fast uh, that, that uh, many of us, not only my generation, surely my generation, but even for your generation, this move of technology is uh, changing the way we live, the way we work, our expectations, our aspirations, the jobs that are ahead of us. Uh, and actually, one of my uh, moments of aha uh, on that rapidity of change came uh, back in Bulgaria with my granddaughter. She was at that time five. And as a good grandmother, I was telling her how when I was her age, life used to be. I said there was no TV, there were no computers. And I, my granddaughter looks up to me and says, so you only had iPads. <laughs> The point is that, that, of course, that transformation that has happened uh, that may make her think that it is absolutely natural for iPads to be in everybody's hands in the 50s. Uh, it is something that we need to really reflect on. We need to recognize that um, uh, technological advancements can be a huge blessing, uh, but they also bring 
uh, risks. And it is actually a Nobel Prize winner uh, who once said, technology is a useful servant, but a dangerous master. And we need to look at what does it mean to have in this world of ours massive shifts in technology disruptive, the, disrupting the way we work and live. And what does it mean for developing countries? Is this a chance for them to leapfrog, create new opportunities, or is it a risk that they would fall further behind? And as you can imagine at the bank, uh, because of our mission and commitment to development, this is a question we cannot leave unattended. So very recently, uh, virtually uh, weeks ago, we published our annual World Development Report. It is dedicated to that issue, the future of work. Uh, and we also have done a lot of new work around preparing people for this more agile, fast-changing future. Uh, and what I want to share with you is uh, the key messages that we took out of the work uh, we have done. The first one is that we have to recognize that shift of jobs is happening. This is not something we can, we can stop. Uh, uh, those of you that are sorry, how many of you, of you know what happened when the Industrial Revolution brought machinery? How did people react? How many of you, you know that? Raise your hand. I know. Raise your hand. OK, quite a number of people. So what happened? People, people said, these machines are awful. How can we uh, get rid of them? Let's just break them. So they went out, broke a number of machines. That did not stop technological uh, advancement. So we have to accept that there is shift in, uh, in jobs, in the creation of jobs, and in the destruction of jobs jobs. And here is uh, the first message I want to leave you with. There are more jobs on balance created with technological advancements than jobs destroyed. Uh, in the uh, European Union, where I spent a lot of time, we actually saw this being pretty much in balance with a slight advancement of new jobs. Uh, in fact, the last, in the last decade, it was about 15% of jobs that the EU lost and more than 15% new jobs that were created. So one may say, what's your problem? 15% gone, 50% new. Problem is that the people who lost their jobs are not the people that are taking advantage of new opportunities. And that creates enormous anxiety. It has affected the political mood in Europe dramatically. It has given very fertile ground to populism. And if you look at the United States, well, some of it is happening here as well. So when we, when we are uh, looking into that issue of shift in jobs, there are two parameters we need to look at. The first one is uh, obviously skills. What skills do you need for the jobs of the future? I'm sure you know that, and I'm sure you are working very hard to acquire exactly these skills. Uh, we need more uh, cognitive, social skills, problem solving, capacity to adapt to different jobs, being in a fluid market, job market, but finding your place. Uh, and uh, that actually is not easy. It is easy to say, but not so easy to produce. Uh, and the second thing we look at uh, is uh, how can you, throughout your lifetime, adapt to new conditions? What is your learning potential over time? So we put this skills issue in front of us, and this is the second message I, leave, I want to leave with you. And we concluded that we, as human race over the last decades, have been a bit um, complacent in terms of investing in people. 
this has not been sufficiently front and center, especially in the developing world. Uh, in the beginning of this year, we uh, published a report on the wealth of nations. We ask a question, how rich is our world? Do you know how rich it is? What is the total wealth? 1,123 trillion dollars of wealth. What was surprising was that two-thirds of this wealth are not the buildings and not the forests and not the fisheries. It is us. It is people. And even more important, uh, the richer a country is, the higher a share of human capital in its wealth. The poorer a country is, the smaller this share. So what that, that means for us in the development uh, world is, wait a minute, we are helping countries build roads and create industries and expand our agriculture. We, we help them manage, manage their natural capital. But how well are we doing in helping them to invest in their most precious asset? The one that if you have it today, you will be rich tomorrow. So we launched in Bali during our annual meetings a new index. It is called Human Capital Index, which ranks countries from top to bottom on their human capital. So which one is the country that is number one in our index? Anybody? Sorry, okay, you guys, you know I'm coming. You could have looked on our web page. <laughs> what is it that we published? Uh, I'll tell you, number one in the index is Singapore. My country, Bulgaria, is number 44. And uh, Chad, right there almost at the bottom, um, is way, way, way worse off than Singapore is. What we measure in, with this index is to what degree a child born today would reach its full potential. And we say full potential is 100. A Singaporean kid at 18 would reach 88% of this potential. A Bulgarian child would reach 68%. And by the way, a Bulgarian girl would reach 71, and a Bulgarian boy, 65. <laughs> but the Chadian uh, kid would only reach 29% of its potential. And when we compose the index, we look at health, we look at years of schooling, but we also look into something new, which we invented and we measure, and it is called learning adjusted school years. You may be in school for 12 years, but learn only for 10, which is the case in Bulgaria pretty much. So we created this index, and it was amazing to see the pickup of countries when we put it forward. Incredible. Countries were lining up to have a chance to be what we call early adopters, to have a chance to understand what measures they can take to improve their standing. And we are now, uh, actually I started the day uh, this morning with our country directors uh, via video from all over the world. And we at the bank are actually now saying, this is really very successful, but boy, how are we going to respond to all the demand of helping countries invest in their people? The third message I want to leave you with is very, very important. And it is about the kind of jobs that the future would offer. In developing countries today, vast majority of jobs are the, in the informal economy. Well, up to now, we at the World Bank would be telling countries, you have to put your jobs in the formal economy. But we are looking at the trends, and actually, 
fluidity of jobs, in other words, more informality, the gig economy is spreading, it is not shrinking. Meaning that developing countries have to find a way to benefit from technology, but at the same time deal with the issue of informality and its negative impacts. And this is my fourth message. What are the negative impacts of informality? There are basically two. One, an informal job, you get your income, it is very difficult to tax it. But when the state cannot collect taxes, it has no money to invest in education, health, the physical environment, or protection of nature. So informality is actually not only bad for the individual who doesn't know what is going to happen to him or her the next day. It is bad for society. Many, many developing countries struggle to reach 15% of GDP collected as taxes, which is the minimum they need to function as countries. The second problem with uh, informality is how do you protect people when they're weak, when they're sick, when they're jobless? What system of social protection you put in place in an economy that is with fluid jobs or great degree of informality. So in our report uh, on the future of work, we put a lot of emphasis on this, trying to answer these two questions. What do you do with taxation and what do you do with social protection? So on taxation, what we are saying is that there has to be much more competent way of taxing the corporate and in the digital world we live in, to tax digital companies. In fact, in the United Kingdom, they just introduced 2% tax on digital um, companies, uh, and uh, the European Union is considering a 3% tax. Now, how do you think Google and Amazon uh, respond to that? Bloody murder, ooh, we shouldn't do that. But actually, in my hearts of heart, I'm convinced we should, because we do need the money to go into the training, the skills and the capacity and the roads and all the rest uh, of countries so they are competitive and they function. Another aspect of taxation which I'm very, very attached to is to switch from taxing labor to taxing and goods to taxing bets taxing pollution, and taxing uh, CO2. Now, this, in this country, absolutely hugely popular. <laughs> Someday in the future. But it is, it, is, uh, uh, it is a topic that is becoming much more uh, seriously uh, adopted. There are a number of countries that have incorporated carbon taxes. Uh, many that have not done it have carbon trade, which is another way to capture, to put the price on carbon. Uh, in parentheses, uh, at, at the bank, we strongly believe that we need price on a ton of carbon between 40 and $60 if we want to change the trajectory on climate for our planet. So we need to think of how we tax in a world where the traditional businesses and in particular traditional way labor functions changes. With regard to social protection, uh, you probably have heard of the um, big, big uh, discussion around uh, uh, universal basic income, yes? How many are in favor of universal basic income? Let me see. Okay, so a good number of people. Uh, at the bank, we are kind of a bit skeptical for now, for one reason. Uh, it, it, it is very expensive. And uh, we, the only country, do you know which is the only country that applied it really wholeheartedly for some time? Mongolia. 
because they have uh, minerals, they have good, uh, well, in good days they had good income, so they introduced it and then they had to, they had to actually abandon it. Uh, there are a number of uh, Nordic countries that are very seriously working on that. Uh, for example, uh, Finland, uh, for sure, is adopting it, and uh, the calculation is it would be 13.8% of GDP of Finland to have it. Maybe the right thing to do. Uh, maybe, maybe if we go more modestly than Finland, uh, around 4% of GDP, this is an affordable proposition. So we are not, we are not closing on that. Uh, we have some some concerns that it may be premature for developing countries to jump there. But we do believe that social insurance that is not fully dependent on wage and uh, a uh, more of the Danish flex security model, one that, that encourages work but provides also some backing and security uh, is absolutely appropriate. Which way we go as a world doesn't at the moment, it, it is not entirely clear. What is clear is for public policy folk like you, there is so much in the field of public policy that is becoming pressing because of disruptive technologies, because of this future of work. Uh, of course, uh, there are many, many uh, folks that are talking about ro robots, substituting people, um, elite living forever because of capturing technology. And that may all happen, but if we have good public policy in place, whatever happened in the future would be for the betterment of human race. If you study hard, how many of you are public policy, in public policy? Well, it is. So, the solution is your hands, you study very hard, you go out there and fix it. <laughs> I'm going to conclude with uh, one lesson I have drawn in terms of fixing things. And it is put money in the hands of women. If women collect taxes and women spend it in, uh, uh, for social purposes, we would live in a wonderful world. So let me thank you very much and let's move to questions. Thank you. Okay, well, thank you. Well, that was great. That was uh, uh, really, really interesting. And so um, what I'd like to do is um, we'll just start uh, chatting a little mm -hmm. bit. But again, we really, uh, uh, I'm really excited to hear the questions that you have, uh, as is Dr. Gorgieva uh, uh, as well, I'm sure. So the, um, the thing I'd like to start with is, um, so I'd like to note there's a, a World Bank report called The, the Future of Work. Mm -hmm. and, yep. and it's a really, really interesting report. Um, and it gets at you know, many of the themes that, that, that we just heard. Um, and, and I was just struck by how the you know, future of work, just in and of itself, is obviously an important issue in so many ways. But how it just spans, so obviously economics, um, but then social aspects, political aspects, just the, the, you know, um, the, the well-being of people, the identity, the self-identity uh, that we all have is, is uh, of course, all these things are wrapped up in work. So it's a really interesting uh, report. So, but one of the themes that, that then I want to uh, uh, try to uh, see how this all fits together in your mind is, is a few of the themes. So one we heard, you know, there's this worry that robots will take our job, but you know, probably not, right? But they'll take some people's jobs mm. and they'll give other people their jobs. So there's dislocation. And then what's the right solution for that when that dislocation happens? Well, there should be a robust safety net, mm -hmm. you know? And so that seems pretty reasonable. But then the, here's the catch, or here's the thing I'm, where I think we're all trying to figure out is, with this dislocation, the political response to that dislocation has been, 
you know, one of the things in the crosshairs in the politics of that has been to undermine the social safety net. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes it's a little vague, but you look at this country or Brazil or other places where populism has, has arisen, like it usually comes with tax cuts, <laughs> right? As some center part of that or, you know, a part of that. And so there's, there's a real challenge, even though like it's, you know, we'd like it to just say, man, dislocation, people realize we need a safety net and they ask for a safety net and we give it and we're happy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we're not there. So how does this populism fit in or what are your thoughts Thoughts about how that fits in with the, that right. environment? Uh, well, the, uh, the, the big problem about populism is that it is not grounded in one issue. If it were to be grounded in one issue, there is a better chance that you kind of unpack it and then you take action. Uh, in addition to disruptions that come from uh, technological advancements and movement structural shifts in countries and across countries. We also have a very important other driver of populism, and it is the fear of extremists and the fear of um, the different people. Huh? So we see that we saw it in Europe very big time. And I just want to say this is not necessarily something to be just dismissed and called bad. In Europe, what happened was because of conflicts in the Middle East, in particular the war in Syria, but also conflicts in, uh, in the Sahel, in the Horn of Africa, in Yemen, there was a big arrival of refugees and also job seekers in numbers that overwhelmed Europe. For fairness to Europe, I cannot, I don't know any place where you, if you have one million coming within months, that would not be a shock. Of course, you can say, well, Europe is almost 500 million, they can swallow one million, it's not a big deal. But when it is sudden, and when the uh, uh, social systems are completely not adapted to that kind of arrival, then, of course, it, it was a shock. And the fear of terrorism is not entirely ungrounded because it is happening. So when you get that combination of fears and then you have political movements that are riding on those uh, fears, then it is difficult to zero on one issue and then solve it. Uh, because uh, the skills issue, training people for jobs, creating the uh, possibility to even physically move from one place to another. If it was this one single issue, I think we would have seen more, more progress. Uh, in uh, in uh, the UK, Brexit, if you unpack it, it is fear of the uh, migrants, by the way, mostly the uh, uh, Eastern Europeans, fear of Bulgarians. <laughs> I'm a Bul Bulgarians are coming. Um, it, is, uh, it is at the same time uh, real loss of jobs. It is urban versus rural, rural people, rural people having somewhat different uh, values. And then we have Brexit. And of course, it is uh, uh, right now harmful for, for the UK and Europe. So, just to, to, to stop here, uh, it is the fact that fragility in the world, in countries poor and rich, is multifaceted and the uh, root causes are multiple. And that creates a, um, an environment that is really a blessing for uh, populism. Um, and then I know another uh, one of your, your big interests is obviously the environment and then adaptation to climate change and so forth. So could, it's in it, you were uh, alluding, started to talk about it uh, in your comments, but can you tell us a little bit more about what you're working on in that area? Right. Well, the, uh, uh, how many of you uh, have been following up on the uh, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change in its most recent report? Great. So those who have seen it, uh, what it tells us is quite uh, sobering. It says three things. One, the aspiration to keep temperature rise to 1.5 degree, forget it. 
we lost that one. Yes, some would say we can still be there if we close down all fossil fuel power plants and stop driving our cars today. Second, it says, what we thought was a more gradual impact if you go above 1.5 degree is actually wrong. The change, the difference between 1.5 and 2 degree and above is quite dramatic. And three, what we thought would take longer as impact of climate change is actually happening faster. So what it means for the world is that we have to mitigate, in other words, drop emissions and adapt at the same time. Just look at what happened in Florida, what happened in the Carolinas. We are going to see more extreme weather events, more, more uh, coastal erosion, more hunger because of desertification, because of problems with water. And the poor countries that have done nothing to cause this mess, in many cases, are most dramatically impacted. So we have embraced, uh, uh, um, Bill Gates, Ban Ki-moon, and myself, that commitment to raise political attention to adaptation. Many say adaptation means admitting defeat. So let's continue to mitigate because if you stop, if you say we have to adapt, we have the white uh, flag up. My position is it is not a defeat. This is a defense against the destructive force of nature that is already hitting us. And a little uh, interesting fact, Bill Gates has never before agreed to serve on a commission. He has been invited many, 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 many times, and he would say, no, yet, no, no. This time, he accepted it because he's super worried about feeding the world's population, and he is extremely keen to get innovation to help us all adapt. So I do advise you, take this report, read it, because you know, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, we are the last generation that can curve climate change, and we are the first generation that has to live with its consequences. And all the power to you. Again, I'm, I'm kind of, I feel like it's very easy. I give all the, all the jobs to. <laughs> yeah. We figured it all out. It's very easy. Well, so I'm going to ask one more question, but then I'm going to uh, open it up to your questions as well. And so my question, uh, uh, my next question is, uh, so we have uh, Professor Wiebe leads our Masters of International Development Policy program, and there's a number of students, and, and then there's other students in, in other programs as well, uh, really interested in our uh, making an impact on development and in the development field. And so what advice would you have for those students? Well, uh, two pieces of advice. One. <laughs> concentrate on where the problem is most dramatic. And it is in the countries where extreme poverty is not going down, but up. Which are these countries? Those that experience conflict, smashed by natural disasters, high population growth, very bad governance. If we want to make a mark, and meet the uh, sustainable development goals, especially goal number one, eradicate extreme poverty, it has to be in the places where it is most dramatic. The war against extreme poverty will be won or lost in sub-Saharan Africa and conflict-ridden Middle East. So everything else we do, very good, but it's not going to be a game changer. Two, recognize that public finance can go some way, but unless we unleash the power of private initiative, the entrepreneurial spirit, 
especially of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, we will not have the impact necessary to create jobs of a magnitude to really be meaningful for development. So these are my two kind of wishes. And again, you know, I'm now in this tradition, so here it is. <laughs> Go and do it. Well, great. So um, yes, yeah, so we're going to open up to questions. So um, please uh, keep your questions brief. Tell us who you are and what program you're with. And we're going to have, there's going to be microphones coming down the three different aisles. So um, maybe down here. Uh, hello, thank you for being here. Um, my name is Alan Mack. I'm a freshman in the School of Foreign Service. Um, Bill Gates raised the idea of a tax on robots. Mm -hmm. uh, the same idea was uh, reintroduced as part of um, Benoit Hamon, a French socialist candidate for the, the French presidential election. Yep. Um, it's, a, it's a candidate who's also favorable to universal income. Um, what is your view on this robot tax idea? And could it be a source of funding for educational training in this increasingly fluid job market? Yeah. I mean, there, there is, uh, uh, of course, uh, already tax on capital. That is happening. Um, and the question is, uh, if we were to revamp that tax to be specifically on uh, robots, what is it that we would gain with it? And what is it that we will lose with it? I think that uh, everything is possible. You can put the tax uh, in any shape or form. But what is your big objective here? If it is to raise money, you can raise money in ways that you create positive externalities uh, like a carbon uh, tax. So uh, that would be my, my, my sense is that it sounds great, but it is, yeah, it would raise revenues, but it is not really from a policy, public policy perspective, maybe not a superior uh, way uh, to do it. And again, it, you know, people do tax. Uh, uh, capital, um, how you establish your rates, um, what is the uh, functionality uh, if you are in a society where they do not have robots or have very few of them. So it's kind of a, so we are not, I'm not, um, some of my colleagues would say, no, nah, don't do it. I wouldn't go that way because the future is, uh, uh, not quite so predictable as it used to be when, when I, I was young. So kind of keep your mind open. My point is there are better ways uh, to achieve revenue raising and a policy externality at the same time. Great, great. Um, we have a question here. Uh, Dr. Cristalina, my name is Lina Zuluaga. I'm from Colombia. Uh, uh, I truly believe that each country of the world has the poorest country inside in, in, in one way. In my country, we have problems. We're receiving Venezuelan migration. We have yep. released one million uh, ideas. And here at Georgetown, I'm in, a, I'm in, a, in a program that is learning design and technology. Well, we're building a global career bridge. So I wonder how the World Bank could collaborate with us. We want to leverage the talent of Colombian, Venezuelans, Bulgarian, many people that is abroad mm -hmm. to help the poorest people of each of our countries that need help from us. So I wonder how we can collaborate with you. Well, the, uh, uh, the, the, the World Bank has a, uh, quite an extensive uh, outreach program. We work with civil society, we work with think tanks, we work with universities, and we try to uh, be a transmission line for ideas. So a good idea in one place can then be uh, translated to another place. Uh, we are not so good in um, managing pools of volunteers that we don't do, but we are very good in creating conditions for uh, best experience South-South, North-South, to be translated, to be, to be shared. As for the um, uh, Venezuelans in, uh, in Colombia, um, 
One of the big issues we have been raising over the last years is uh, fragility in middle income countries. Usually when people talk about fragility, it is a poor country that is, you know, it's Mali or Niger uh, or Cameroon or Chad. But what we're seeing more often is spillover of fr fragility from one country to another. Syrian conflict impacting Jordan and Lebanon. Venezuelan uh, departures, the uh, social stress in Venezuela impacting uh, Colombia, but also a little bit Brazil, uh, the, the rest of, uh, uh, of, the, of the neighborhood. And what we are saying at the bank is that we have to reassess the eligibility for assistance of countries. We created a global facility for refugees, which is donor money that we use to bring down cost of borrowing for middle income countries, down to the cost of borrowing of poor countries. Why? Because of Jordan and Lebanon. And actually now we are working, it, you might be interested to know, to create a similar facility for Colombia. So Colombia, despite of the fact it is a middle income country, can have access to concessional finance so that you can do the good uh, work of helping uh, uh, the Venezuelans that are coming. Um, hello, my name is Harsh Tube. I am a sophomore in the School of Foreign Service. And um, I wanted to ask you about your question, about your remarks about developing countries. Or My question is that, what do you make of the idea that we can't think as much in terms of developed and developing countries as in terms of inequalities within countries? Mm -hmm. So for example, the idea that some areas of DC have a lower life expectancy than Bangladesh or things like that. Well, it is, it is a little bit the question that came from uh, uh, our friend here from Colombia. Uh, inequalities uh, within countries uh, uh, have expanded almost everywhere. If you take the, both the uh, Nordic countries out, you know, Denmark, Finland, uh, Norway, if you take them out, practically uh, almost everywhere in the world, inequalities uh, have grown over the last uh, decade. And uh, what it means is that somehow our societies are not able to value equality as a source of uh, productivity and uh, more inclusiveness. So what happens is very interesting. When you rank countries on happiness, who comes on top? Scandinavians, the countries that are more equal. And just when you think about it, it's dark there. It's cold. <laughs> but they beat the rest of the world. And obviously, the fact that these are more, you know, there is more equality in the society is a major factor. The other things that, that work for happiness, solidarity. Countries and societies and communities that are Helping each other more, people are happier. Uh, and in that sense, I think it is so very important that we think of our societies, especially in this more fragile world of ours, and what can we do to generate more of that solidarity um, and sense of, um, of belonging together. And that, of course, would come up with, we would come up with the right policies that drive inequality uh, down. Uh, when I was commissioner for humanitarian aid and, and had the front seat in the most dramatic crisis of, of these days, uh, um, the Syria uh, war, the uh, uh, Haiti earthquake, one thing that always impressed me was that actually majority of people are very good people. Goodness is much more broadly available than hate. But goodness is very quiet. Hate is very, very loud. And when hate and, and anger dominate, that destroys the fabric that could have led to more equality, could have led to more solidarity. 
So my, my message to young people is you have a duty to embrace and kind of elevate that voice, that sense of goodness, because the world you would live in would be more equal and a happier place. My name is William, first year MPP student. Uh, I'm just curious how the World Bank works with uh, grassroots organizations and local communities in the, in the countries that you're giving uh, resources to to help them improve on human capital and what kind of synergies you guys have going on there? It's a great question. In, in fact, the World Bank, many decades ago, uh, was a very headquarter-based place right here in um, uh, downtown DC. And uh, the way we worked work in these days would be government to government. So you go, meet the Minister of Finance, sign a project, go back home. And then we realized that if, if we are to deal with poverty and inclusion, we have to work with people where the problems are. So we have become a highly decentralized organization. I run a place with offices in 120 countries. And we became much more bottom-up, community-driven development place. We have massive programs that are about empowering communities to prioritize their needs and then to oversee the implementation of our projects. Uh, I was in uh, Indonesia uh, very recently visiting a community where the purpose of our engagement across Indonesia is to make sure that local health clinics reach out to everybody who needs health service, and in particular, little kids that suffer from stunting. In other words, they don't develop well. And it was such a joy to see how in the center of the community, they had a map of all houses, and the houses where there was risk of stunting were in red. They knew exactly uh, where people, uh, people were with problems. And actually, they showed me a, a baby boy that was stunted and now is fine, and, and the whole community uh, cherishes it. But that engaging of people, I mean, it's not, it's, this is not like uh, brain surgery. People know best what they need. And it is a question of empowering them so they can actually uh, meet that need. So we work, we work very intensively. Of course, we have many projects that are large scale infrastructure, uh, but I would say about 40% of our programs are community driven, community based programs. Question here. Um, hi, I'm from Communication, Culture, and Technology program first year. Um, I'm interested in uh, what is your opinion about how in, uh, ICTs can possibly bring solidarity in community from local based level, and uh, what is possibly they can what the World Bank can possibly like cultivate that culture, trust community. Well, that's a little bit of continuation of the same, uh, same, same question. Uh, the very best way uh, one can engage uh, uh, communities uh, is to create the incentive for the community to work together. Uh, so what we do very often is uh, uh, block grants that we give to a community, and the only two conditions are the community has to decide collectively what they would use the money for, and we will supervise whether what is agreed to be funded is publicly available. So you can see on a, on a white board in the center of, of the community what this money is going for, who is responsible. So we try to cultivate that kind of collective responsibility. We do not engage in political programs. I, I didn't quite, I wasn't able to quite well hear your question. My question was, what is the role of information communication technology ah, in this I'm sorry, sorry, process I missed that. I missed that. Well, I mean, look, the uh, uh, huge, huge. One, one um, communication technology allows us uh, uh, to um, oversee what we finance in a very different way. So, uh, give you one example. In Pakistan, uh, we finance uh, education. But we don't know 
what happens? So are the teachers going to work or not? And the absenteeism not going to work very massive. So what we did was we created an app, put it on the phone of uh, uh, parents, also ch all the children that had phones. So everybody has this app. And all they do is they click, is the teacher there or not? <laughs> and guess what? Absenteeism dropped dramatically. Teachers started going to work and actually teaching. Uh, we, have, um, we use uh, technology uh, to see whether a rod is being built. And then, of course, now we can even see, is the uh, material used the right material? Because you can, take, you can take a picture, and then you can process it, and you know it. Uh, we use uh, uh, technology a lot to give citizens access to information in their own governments. Like, we do budget projects. We finance a municipal. Uh, budgeting. And uh, we demand that it is transparent, electronic, and we demand that citizens can see what the heck are they doing with their money. And that is very easy to achieve with technology uh, today. Uh, my favorite use of uh, technology is uh, to get uh, the feedback loop between citizens and their uh, governments. In, in other words, to get the voices of citizens in the high uh, corridors of power. Uh, recently, we worked with the president of Uzbekistan, who Uzbekistan was for 25 years very close. You know, you know the, here is the government, and here are the people. And the, the new president of Uzbekistan said, I want to be open and transparent. No problem. So we created a, a link. Every citizen can write to him. And we put the condition that he has to answer within three days. So guess, you know, he's like swamped <laughs> with, let, with, with citizens sending their questions to him. What, what does he do? He said, oh, cannot be just me, because too many people write to me. So he opened up the whole government. Now, citizens can write to anybody who is at any level of government. President says, oh, thank God, now that goes the, the uh, 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 river of, uh, of engagement goes uh, to many other directions. So openness, transparency, this is, this is with uh, technology today, very easy thing. Uh, you, we get in every project we fund, we demand that there is public information and access to information. We actually are the organization that went most aggressively in open data. Problem, however, what is the problem, you know? Problem is, data not necessarily is information. Because if you throw too much data out without navigation in this data, you are lost. So one of the, one of the problems we are trying to solve is how to, how to make open data to be easily uh, accessible, and how, how can you navigate in that river of data? So very interesting. If you want to know more, here is Maura. She is one of our communications uh, people. Actually, in front of you is uh, one of our colleagues. You, they can tell you more about that. I think there are questions right here. Yeah. Maddie right here in the. Hi, I'm Allie Woodruff. I'm with the McDonough School of Business as an MBA student. Um, my question kind of revolves around your comment about how corporations and social entrepreneurs can maybe take a bite out of this puzzle. I was wondering if you could expand a little bit more on some ideas you have for either corporations coming on board through their social responsibility or through public policy and mm -hmm. business working better with government. Well, the, um, uh, the whole movement toward uh, corporate social responsibility actually started uh, first from the environmental side. And we at the World Bank uh, set up our own social responsibility program. And it, the, first, the first lack of the program was about the environment. Uh, and then what we realized uh, is that there are three ways in which we can promote social responsibility beyond us. One 
is the signal we send to financial markets with the money we raise, how we raise this money. We were the first organization to issue green bonds. Uh, we now issue uh, gender bonds. We issued a couple of days ago our first blue bond to protect the uh, uh, Maldives, uh, um, basically to help the Maldives manage their blue economy. So the first thing is how you frame financing on scale that aligns with social and environmental responsibility. Second is to promote standards. What does it mean to be socially responsible? How can that be measured? And again, in standard setting, we have gone quite, quite a long uh, way, uh, including by, by looking into ourselves. Uh, for example, we are a big purchaser of services and goods in DC. So we ask ourselves, how are we doing that? How good are we? We found out, for example, that only 4% of those we buy services from are women-owned businesses. And here we are telling the rest of the world that women entrepreneurship is a great thing. So we set the target to go from 4 to 10, and of course we want to go uh, further. That kind of standardizing on big issues and demonstrating it can be done, it can be measured. And the third thing, thing we do is uh, we engage with the socially responsible uh, investors as a community to create a critical mass of, uh, of sort of messaging on why this is uh, so, so important. Hi, my name's Sterling Ruffin, and uh, I'm a graduate student here. Um, we had a discussion briefly with a couple questions about increasing solidarity means more happiness. And we said the Scan Scandinavian countries have a lot of solidarity, so they're happy. And we said earlier that populism is bad. Uh, that seems to me, increasing solidarity seems like a great argument for populism. How do you, if populism is bad, how do you increase solidarity with avoiding populism? Well, I mean, I wouldn't say populism is categorically bad because uh, it is a reflection of where people's minds are. It is, you, you don't export it from Mars, right? It is grown here on our, our planet and there is a reason why it is there. Uh, but I do believe that societies that make it possible for less inequality and for more common responsibility, they are also societies where populism in this sense of, of, of being uh, kind of a way to um, offer no real solutions to very real problems uh, doesn't have so much uh, uh, space. This being said, look at the Nordics. They have their own populist movements, mostly driven because of fear of migration. This is their origin. Uh, I actually, I'm, I'm less concerned about the fact that there is uh, populism. I'm concerned when Populism translates into really bad, antagonizing people, putting them against each other. And in some countries, in some places, this is happening. And in other places, it is much, much less uh, so. I'm thinking of my own country, Bulgaria. We have our own uh, kind of populist uh, uh, parties. Um, they are basically promising people things that they cannot deliver. Um, sometimes they get voted in and then they get voted out because they don't deliver. Uh, populism, I think, is a very complicated, complex uh, phenomenon. It's not one single thing. Hello, uh, my name is Dushant. I'm a first year policy student from India. 
I uh, don't see you. Wa wave. <laughs> there is. <laughs> Ah, okay. <laughs> so my name is Dushant. I'm a first year uh, policy student from India. Uh, you talked about uh, technology increasing jobs uh, in Europe. Well, while that be true, that be true for Europe and uh, Western countries where there is an oversupply of uh, skilled labor. But in my mm -hmm. country and my part of the region, which is India and Southeast Asia, uh, automation combined with uh, climate change is, had led to disastrous effects. So. In fact, in the recent uh, World Bank report, uh, India jumped uh, 23 points in the use of doing business. Mm -hmm. But the fact that in human development index is still beyond 150 is, is, is a kind of disastrous effect in itself. So how does World Bank see uh, that part of the world where we have uh, both sides of the things, we have mm -hmm. development as well as literacy rate still at 60%. Thank you. Well, uh, India did jump uh, big time in doing business. And that is a good thing. The government is making an effort to create conditions for entrepreneurs to invest at all levels. But India has a huge problem with population that is uh, way under even the average for the region in the human uh, capital, capital index. So big country with tons of problems, but also with a very uh, strong bent towards finding solutions on a scale. India is the country that introduced um, uh, identity on a massive scale for a billion people. Uh, India is a country where growth rate has been over 6% year after year after year. Uh, my, if I have one advice, and this is what we tell the Indian government, our advice to the Indian government is uh, concentrate uh, uh, much more seriously long-term on investing uh, in your population. Both health indicators are problematic to, to a great degree also because of environmental uh, degradation in India being quite severe. And educational outcomes are way, way under where India could be. Uh, I was actually quite shocked because you talk about the Indians and uh, very smart people, very entrepreneurial. India has the, the fastest growth of apps, for example, home, home produced apps. And at the same time, the uh, educational uh, attainment and performance, very low. So when we dig into that, uh, actually big regional swings. And uh, uh, obviously bringing a country of that size to a higher level and shrinking this uh, regional uh, difference is not an easy task, uh, but one that has to be pursued. So best of luck, get up on that ranking too. By the way, if you look at doing business, India was 130 something two years ago, now it is 77. So you put your mind on that, boom, change happened. Put your mind on human capital index now. Question in the back. Um, hi, my name is Linda Fawaz. I'm in the um, economics program. Um, I'm wondering how the World Bank sees um, the difference in um, supporting and empowering developing and poor communities um, like that are just having development issues versus those that are actually um, what I guess would be considered fragile communities. Mm -hmm. So maybe that are in like a, a conflict and development like a uh, loop. So I'm wondering like how does the World Bank uh, deal with these types of uh, issues differently? I mean, the, the, uh, this is actually the biggest uh, uh, change in the bank in the last couple of years. A commitment to be present in countries that are experiencing conflict and fragility. In the uh, past, for the bank, place of conflict was place we cannot be present, we cannot operate in. And then we realize that uh, fragility is now a more, more of a permanent phenomenon, unfortunately. You have recurrent crisis and you have protracted crisis in far too many places. So the way we changed our, if you wish, business model is to be located and to operate permanently, even in situations of conflict. What we do is we partner with organizations that have a uh, 
higher tolerance for insecurity, like uh, now we work with the Red Cross and we work with uh, UNICEF, we work with the UN humanitarian organizations, so we can build an engagement. And then, of course, we work with local organizations, community-based organizations, so we can have more permanency of engagement and more impact. Yes? Uh, actually, <clears throat> I just got back from Iraq. I was, <clears throat> I was working with the UN in Iraq for um, two years, actually. And um, I was doing some research also on the ground. And one of the interesting things is that people, um, when, you, when you go to these communities, and we were like mapping which hyper-locally like, are the most fragile. Uh, people where ISIS was just evicted from their areas, they're not talking about ISIS. So ISIS is gone, and they still consider their community like on the verge of like horrible like decline and conflict, even though they will not invite ISIS back into their towns. But at the same time, uh, as someone that was working in the UN, like I can I can say that uh, they're still difficult to reach mm -hmm. and actually. Uh, make a difference because of a lot of times the government. So I'm wondering from like a governmental perspective and then like how you deal with private sector and government in a country like Iraq, it's the most corrupt in, in the world, one of the most corrupt in the world. Well, it is one of many that are quite, uh, uh, quite corrupt and uh, uh, the one, th what we do in this situation is uh, to engage either directly with a uh, local partner, like uh, in Iraq when, uh, when, the, uh, when ISIS moved out from the Mosul area, we were the organization that rebuilt all the bridges so people can start moving around and we rebuilt the schools and the medical, medical facilities right after the withdrawal of, of uh, ISIS. How did we do it? We did it with third-party monitoring. We did it using technology, using uh, uh, drones and uh, satellite surveillance. So there can be investment happening uh, right away. But I admit it is very difficult to retain physical presence uh, in communities, in fragile communities. This is not our best uh, comparative strength. It is more for uh, humanitarian organizations to function in, this, in these environments. And to the extent possible, we partner with them. Like, if there is a presence of Red Crescent, we would partner with Red, Red Crescent to get health services established. We will provide the financing, maybe the medical um, bridge to, to, to facilities uh, uh, somewhere else. Uh, but I'm, 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 uh, I'm the first to admit that uh, being there, physically there, in fragile communities uh, remains a very difficult, very difficult task for organizations like mine. So, well, great. Well, this has been uh, an honor and a pleasure. And so please join me in thanking Dr. Gaviria. Thank you.